So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar which is comparison testing and claims. So myself and Thomas uh, are here today to talk through the webinar with you. So we're going to be looking a lot about um, sort of from Thomas's side certainly the statistics that go behind comparison testing and how to think about what kind of comparison you, you want to do, what kind of test you want to do. Um, and I'll be looking more on the regulatory side and talking about you know all the regulations you have to be aware of when you're making comparison claims. So just to go through the agenda. So why do you want to do comparison testing? Why are you choosing this? The types of comparison tests you can do, when to use what kind of test, uh, the impact of sample size, which is very important when we're looking at comparison testing, uh, what happens when you're comparing more than two products, um, and we're looking at comparison and competitor claims as well. So Thomas, please can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Karis. Um, <clears throat> I'm Thomas, Thomas Marquardt, and I'm got, I think, more than 25 years of experience in market research. So I'm definitely a market researcher by profession and by heart. Um, I spent most of my professional life in Unilever, a company that most of you will know. Uh, and I don't know how many product tests I've run uh, throughout my career and my time in, in Unilever. <clears throat> where I worked on different categories, uh, lots of food categories uh, on a local German one, European one and a global scale. Um, I left the company to create my own con market research consultancy and I joined Aiton as the head of the German business. Uh, and that's why I'm here and I'm very happy to talk about some of my experience and what you can do with us in terms of market research and comparison testing. Amazing, thank you, Thomas. Before I introduce myself, I did forget to say there's going to be a Q&A towards the end. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I put that in there. And the, the webinar is being recorded, so I will send it out to everyone. Um, but yeah, please feel free to make a note of any questions as we go through, and we'll be happy to answer those at the end. But to introduce myself properly, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. I've been with the company for about eight years now and started off as a study manager, so basically being a client account manager and taking people through their whole study process and really understanding why people did the research that we do. And along with that, I learned a lot about the regulations that are in place and it became a real passion of mine. Um, so that's very much where I'm directed now is to look at any of the regulations that are to do with product testing and advertising standards to make sure that the data that our clients have uh, can be used for their purposes, which is usually claims. Um, so yeah, I've traveled across the world to uh, learn more about different advertising regulations. Of course, not this year, um, but it's certainly something that I'm very interested in. Um, so Thomas, if you can kick us off, please. Yes, of course. So um, there are a number of reasons uh, why you would uh, want to compare products. Uh, even before talking about tests, it's about actually why do you want to comp compare products? Uh, and from what I've seen, I think these are the key, the main reasons why people want to compare products. The first thing is very often I've seen uh, that companies have the choice between two or even more viable alternatives. So you want to bring something out in the market uh, and your R&D department comes up with two alternatives. Both of them look promising, but which one of these will you take? And uh, often actually this is taken as a decision that is done just taken by someone who thinks one is better than the other, or you make a kind of more or less random choice, whilst uh, I think it's often very useful to run a decent test to decide which one is the really better ones and seen from the consumer perspective. Um, what we see very often is you've got a product improvement. So you think of replacing one product with a better version. But this of course, uh, implies some complexity, some costs, some change over, uh, and you want to make sure that uh, the new product is really better than the current one. Besides, very often you want to claim that it's a product improvement, and then of course you need to prove that it's a product improvement. It's not, not just someone who thinks it's better. Equally, um, product rationalization. <clears throat> I've seen many companies thinking of uh, making a product cheaper, uh, and of course, if you, if you make it cheaper, uh, in the end, you don't want to sacrifice on quality. So ideally, you have the same, same, same quality of product with lower production costs. Uh, but then, of course, you better make sure <laughs> that this doesn't hurt you. And when you go out in the market, then con your consumers realize actually that it's not, not only cheaper from your production side, but it's also worse in quality. Um, 
The scene often changes formulations. Uh, so, for instance, you switch your raw material, or you want to take out some uh, ingredients that are seen as uh, nasty, like aluminium, for instance. Uh, so, you change your formulation, uh, and still you want to make sure the product performs as good as before. So, you would compare the new one with the old one. Uh, or even you might go down to changing the source and sourcing site production method. I've <clears throat> seen this now with the with the with the Brexit that some of my my German uh, companies changed the production site so they had produced in the UK before and moved production to Europe. And you might consider testing if this is actually a viable way and uh, if the product has changed or not. And last but not least. Uh, you want to see where, how you perform versus your comp competitive competition. So you might actually change against your competitor to see which of these products is better, yours or the competitors. So lots of reasons uh, for comparison testing um, that, that you might definitely consider. In some cases, it's almost automatic that you think of a test. In some cases, I feel that Many companies don't see this as a necessity. It's not, but it's uh, if to be on the safe side, often it's definitely worth considering. So, how do you test? And it sounds so easy, <laughs> but as always, there are different options uh, and different possibilities how to test it. And uh, we will go. Even if it's a bit theoretical. I think it's worth flagging some of these terms and the differences between different kinds of tests. So in, in general, I would say there are three different kinds of tests. Uh, and the, the first one is a monadic test. Second one is a sequential, sequential monadic test. And you can do direct comparison tests. So uh, it sounds technical, but I explain it a bit in a minute now what the difference between these is. Monadic test means that you, if you've got two products, you've got different test groups who test these products. So two completely different groups of consumers test uh, a product individually, independently of each other. <clears throat> of course, that's why we have statistics. So in the end, you can see uh, if you've got the same target group, the same, uh, of course, we've got the same recruitment criteria. So these groups in, in them themselves should be comparable. Uh, and by comparing the results, you can see if one of these products is different or better than the other. The second one, and this is, I think, the one that we use most often, is a so-called sequential monadic test, which means now for the example of two products, uh, you've got a test group who first tests product A and then product B, and the second test group has first tests product B and then product A. So that means each respondent is testing both products, but uh, of course you need to make sure that you've got a certain order in there because what you should never forget, there's always an order effect. If you test one product first, it has an impact of how you perceive the second product. Um, at the end, uh, and this is the charm of this, these kind of tests, you, of course, you can ask people to compare. So now you've seen these two products, which of these do you think is better in terms of whatever, performance, smell, whatever you like. Uh, but so, so you have the, in the end, you have the monadic evaluation. So you can actually look at the first experience people had with the first exposure people had with the product. You can have the overall comparison. So all experience of product A versus all product A versus product B. And at the end, you've got a final comparison. So you can actually see how many people rate product A better than product B. So it's a lot of data to look into uh, with different levels of granularity and detail, uh, which in the end allows you to come to useful conclusions. Um, the last one I want to mention, something I think we're not using that very often, is if you have a direct comparison. So you directly compare product A to product B. This means, of course, that it needs to be comparable one way or the other. So if you've got a perfume, of course, you can make uh, one perfume on your left, uh, left arm and the other one on your right arm and then smell side by side. Or if you've got something to taste, you can prepare both dishes both and have one, one fork of the first and one fork of the other and go back. Uh, and then you can make direct comparison, which of course is the sharpest and the toughest way of identifying comparisons. 
Um, last but not least, something to mention. Here is the triangle test, uh, which I used to call the Sesame Street test because it says one of these things is not like the others. Uh, you get three samples to, 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 to uh, experiment with or to sample, very often in foods, so three products to, to trial. Uh, and one of these will be different than the others, than the other two. So uh, respondents are asked to say which, which of these is the odd one out. And of course, statistically, if all products are the same, uh, one third would, would, uh, would point to A, one third would be point to B, one third would point to C. And if this is significantly different, then you can say the product is really different than the others. This is the most sensitive and most uh, direct test to understand if a product is really different than from the others. So when do you use which kind of test? And as, as usually market research, as simple as it seems, is, is a bit of an art <laughs> and a bit of a science. Uh, and there are lots of things to consider to go to, to, to base your decision on. And of course, we will help you in the end. Uh, some key considerations I put here is uh, the clo how close is it to consumer reality? Because one of my guiding principles has always been test as close to consumer reality, because this is in the end what counts. Uh, how sensitive is the test? How, how long is the test period and uh, what about the test costs in the end, of course, in the end it's all about the business case. So uh, evaluating consumer reality, how will consumers compare different products? You need to ask yourself. As said, if you, if you go, if you want to buy a, an order toilet, you might actually go into a shop and compare your, as I said, your left and your right hand in terms of scent. Then you have a direct comparison. Uh, but in most cases, there's no direct comparison because consumers buy a product, they have a soap or they have a soup, <laughs> if you come to food or anything, uh, they might use it up and they might restock afterwards, which means uh, they will only, mem only uh, remember the, 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 the previous product, but they will not be able to directly compare it. This is... Uh, this is in most cases the reality, but there are exceptions. For instance, uh, the one I mentioned, but I also support with professional chefs, for instance, in cooking. Uh, if you've got a professional chef and he wants to buy a new bouillon, he will sample several and have them in front of his, in front of his, uh, himself on the kitchen table and compare. So think of how consumers would use the product and how consumers would really compare them if they compare it and uh, design your test accordingly. The second one is actually this test sensitivity. Um, <clears throat> and I think in a way, if you think of it, uh, it becomes obvious that the more direct the comparison, the more sensitive a consumer will perceive differences. So if you've got them side by side, you immediately see the differences. If you test them one after the other and compare, you still have a fairly sensitive test. If in the, in the monadic sense where you only test one product and you just have to compare different te uh, test groups, this is the least sensitive test. So in order of sensitivity, I would say monadic testing is the least sensitive one. Uh, sequential monadic is more and the direct comparison the, the, the most sensitive one to, to identify differences. Of course, this has cost implications. Uh, the key driver for test are the number of participants. Very obviously so, and you will see it in our price list. <laughs> if, you, if you ask 100, 100 consumers, it's more expensive than 50 consumers, and if you are 200, it's even more expensive. Um, therefore, the monadic approach is usually the most expensive one, because we, as we always say, you should have at least 100 respondents, but it means you would have then at least two times 100 respondents, which means 200 respondents if you go for mon monadic design, whilst with a se sequential monadic, you can probably go with 100. Um, and second, but, but secondly, uh, mentioning the sample size, it's key to have an eye on it. And I would like to share, to illustrate this a bit to you. Um, and now it becomes a bit technical, <laughs> but I think you can, I hope you can follow me. Uh, comparison has, has the objective to find out if two products are different. And I've just made, an ex made up an example. We have got a data, could be a five point scale in terms of purchase intent. So one product scores 4.3, the other point 3.8. So this looks good. You would might say actually product A is better than product A, uh, product B. But actually uh, as a statistician, no, go, go back to one chart. Briefly, <laughs> thanks. 
Um, but as a statistician, you would look actually how is this, uh, is this significant? And the higher the sample size, the higher is the chance to identify significant differences. And this is actually, if you can do this best by looking at confidence intervals, I think this is for, for uh, otherwise there are always very complicated statistical figures, but confidence intervals are a nice way of visualizing it. So if we look at the next, next chart now, <laughs> Um, I've tried, this is a, just, a, just of course a made up example, but um, the conf confidence interval is shown by these, uh, these lines show the probability of, uh, show 95% pro probability that the, the real average is between these lines. So you might have measured 4.3, but in reality it might be 4.5 or it might be 4 or it might be 4.6. Uh, and the confidence interval is the the interval uh, in in which is most likely this area will be, or the the, the average will be. Uh, the same over here with a low sample size, you have a big confidence interval because uh, in the end you don't have so you you can't be so certain about the real outcome, which means with a low sample size, like in the example on the left left hand side, you see the confidence intervals overlap, and if the confidence intervals overlap. Uh, uh, you, you cannot stay, say statistically that this is a significant difference, which even this, if it was 4.3 with a 3.8, in the end, uh, this is not a valid, a statistically valid uh, statement to say that product A is better than product B. So you cannot be sure. If you have a high sample size, this, the significance interval uh, will, become this, uh, will become much smaller as seen in the example on the right hand side. And you will see that in this example, even we've got the same figures, you can say this is, this is significant. So product A is definitely performs better than product B. So you have to keep this in mind before. If you want to have statistically significant differences and you want to highlight them, especially if you want to claim them, uh, you need to make sure that you have an, uh, a, a good sample size uh, because otherwise the outcome will not be relevant and you will not be able to use the results, at least not externally. Um, what about if you test more than two products, which also can often be the case? Um, you can apply the same principles. However, you need to make sure that you manage the complexity. Uh, if you do it monadically, one test group tests one product, it's no issue because consumers only test one product as usually, um, but of course it's costly. Coming back to the examples we had in the beginning, if you have one product with 100 consumers, and if you've got three products, you've got 300 consumers. If you've got four products, you've got 500 consumer, uh, 400 consumers, and so on. If you do it sequential monadic, which, which means you're splitting up the group, uh, you need to think of actually how many products can people reasonably test. So uh, if you ask people to test seven products of the same kind, this is probably a bit challenging for people to really digest it, especially if you want to have them compare at the end. Uh, test length can become an issue because you normally want to have a testing period of maybe two weeks. And you, if, if you add them up, if you've got five products, you've got five times two weeks, which makes, makes it a 10 week test, which often is a bit late for some of the results if you want to use them. Uh, and you need to manage the rotation. Um, I just made show, show a rotation plan on the right hand side uh, because you need to make sure that each product is used uh, at, the, um, at the first, second, third time uh, in, this, in the same order, in the same amount. So for three samples, you've got product A, uh, one third of the time in the first place, one third of the time in the second place, one third of the time in the third place, and the same for other products, which makes it a split of six in the, in the whole test sample. If you've got four samples already been to 24, and I don't want to bore you now with five products, but you can see that the complexity rises, and this is something you need to keep in mind, also on how you deal with the consumer and how you communicate it to people. Direct comparison is simpler, but still you need to think of how much can a consumer handle. Uh, giving them 10 products at the same time is a bit, a bit challenging to most people. And then this, of course, has an impact on the quality of the results. I think it's a good example as well, Thomas, when we talked about direct comparison 
particularly in the field of cosmetics, which obviously we do a lot of testing in, it's, it's very unusual to have a consumer test and have someone do a direct comparison because you'd have to have, I don't know, half your face with one moisturizer, yeah. half with another, which you see a lot on clinical, but yeah, certainly not for consumer. And especially if, yeah, if you had five or something products, you run out of space on your face. Yes. <laughs> um, it's definitely, it's always a bit interesting depending on the product as well. Good point, yeah. <laughs> So just some typical recommendation that I tend to work with. If you, if you have the choice between true product alternatives that you want to introduce, uh, you can do a sequential monetic or even a direct comparison if the product is comparable. <laughs> just Karish just said, if you can actually manage this. Uh, if you go for a product improvement, uh, I would recommend a monadic test uh, because this normally requires really some, some complexity and some cost and you want to make sure the product is really better than the current one. Um, and as said, the monadic one is the, the least sensitive one, which means if a product shows as being significant definitely better in a monadic test, you, are, think you can be sure that consumers will really re realize it and it's worth it. Um, product, res rationaliza product rationalization. Um, I would do sequential monadic because this is becoming more sensitive and you want to make sure that you really are not making a mistake and uh, you are not deteriorating on product quality. Uh, and if you go for competitive evaluation similar, go for a sequential monadic approach because it's sensitive enough to show you differences uh, and, and still uh, very likely you'll find significant differences that you can also com communicate about. Great, thank you, Thomas. <laughs> um, amazing. So I think, yeah, I, the main thing to always take home as well is that every claim and every product is really different. I had a really interesting um, request from a client the other day for a tooth whitening strip against a um, competitor, which obviously when you're looking at teeth whitening, we were saying, you know, sequential monadic is definitely the best kind of test to do a comparison like that. But unfortunately, with a tooth whitening strip, it's going to leave your teeth white. So you can't then go and use another one. So we looked at the possibility of a washout period. But again, um, this is supposed to be a really strong whitening strip. We couldn't, we couldn't kind of nail that down and say what that washout period would be. So then we've gone with monadic because that's going to be the most successful way to look at it get people with the same shade teeth to begin with and see how many shades are improved. So it's really, it's always an interesting one when it comes to comparison. There is definitely mm -hmm. certain recommendations as Thomas has outlined, but every product is different. Um, so we always have to put consideration in place and sometimes it's to do with time as well. I mean, certainly uh, when we do things like supplement studies, there's no possibility that we're going to have six months of one supplement with a wash up period. No it's not of the other so it's certainly more now like a really good way to do that but I always find it really interesting I think it's a fun part of our job is having that task of um, getting these requests and deciding how's the best thing to test it um, so I'm going to go through a case study now about a, um, a, a comparison study that we've done just to put everything that Thomas has described into a bit of context um, and before I go really into the regulations of it all I just want to bring out this bit of legislation and it's relevant to the UK because that's where the study was taking part, um, because I always think it really helps again to have that legislation actually in context with a case study. Um, so from the ASA, basically this was the complex comparison. Um, so different market wide comparisons and things like that. You need to have a large amount of quite technical evidence. So exactly this, you need to have as much data as possible to support your claims essentially. Um, so you need to make sure um, that the information is also really, really um, transparent to your consumers if you're doing this kind of thing. Uh, it's not something you see so much in the UK and EU. There are quite strict competition laws when it comes to comparison, and I will talk about that in a bit of detail. But um, either way, even if you were just to say, you know, the leading, you know, market leading product, there has to be some kind of data behind that. Um, if you say, you know, better than the leading brand, that's something we see quite a lot of. You might not be directly mentioning someone, but you always need to have data behind it. Um, and certainly in the States, we see a lot of uh, direct comparison against competitors. So we need to make sure there's some um, data to back that up. But how do we get that data? So the case study I want to go through is a good one because it's lovely and complicated, as Thomas mentioned, <laughs> with all the different rotations. Um, so it's for a nappy pants product. Um, so baby, baby nappies. 
Um, it's basically a manufacturer who is specialist in hygiene products and they basically want to test them, their three of their own brands against a competitor benchmark. So because they're a contract manufacturer, they'll make lots of different brands, um, but they also want to see where those brands are developing sit against their main competitor as well. So it's a great study to do um, in terms of really getting that data about not just only which is the best of your products, but where does that sit against a benchmark as well? So as I mentioned, a little bit complicated, but I think um, it's, a, it's a really good uh, useful test to get. They're really testing it to find out things like leakage, absorption and fit, everything that is your kind of basic need for your, for your nappies to you know, be used and work and really make sure that see, you know, on each of those levels, how does the product compare? This is the really good thing about comparison studies as well. You're not just saying, this is the best one, this is what the consumers say is the best. You're breaking down every single aspect. Mm -hmm. So maybe if one fits better, but the leakage isn't as good, you can really look at that product development as well, especially with your own brands you're making. Um, so that's, that's the best thing about a comparison study, I think, is that real breakdown of every single aspect. Again, when we're looking at um, you know, cosmetics, that's quite a common one because it could be something along the lines of uh, it was as long lasting and it looked as good as the other cosmetics, but this one smelt much better. <laughs> so people are gonna buy that one. Um, so yeah, it's always, always really interesting to really break that down. So the kind of protocol for this study, uh, it was sequential monadic, as uh, Thomas has kind of talked through before. So we're looking at a basically the uh, the main panel split into kind of four groups, if you will, and they all test one product first and then go into a different sequence. That really complicated table that Thomas just showed us is essentially what this um, what this study was. So it's a 28 day study because it's a one, one week per nappy basically. They get a supply of nappies for a whole week and then test it um, in that kind of order. The actual panel requirements for this uh, were also really specific to be able to make sure we could um, get certain uh, evaluations of people using the right brands. Um, so they always use nappy pants, of course. We had boys and girls separately. Um, there's different kind of uh, evaluations for kind of boy and girl when you're looking at nappies. Um, so from the parents there. And we wanted to make sure that the, um, the, the consumers were either using the competitor brand or they were using the own retail brand they were testing as well. So people that would usually use that brand, so then we can look at that data and say, actually, these people would usually use that competitor and I, they'd rather use our one now or vice versa. It's really good information to have broken down. So the first thing, just to keep things really simple, sorry, a little bit of water. Um, just in terms of the evaluation before we look at the comparison itself. But it's basically at the end of all of our reports, whether it's comparison or a single evaluation or anything like that, you get this really clear breakdown of the overall results. So you have all of your questions on there. In this example, we have the one question, which is the pants of good leakage protection. We've got that for each sample that's been tested. So as you can see, they've been given a really simple code, 101 to 104. We've got the number of people um, that has had a satisfied response, neutral response or not satisfied, and the percentage of people that said that. This is what we usually use in claims, um, because obviously, as you can see, it would be really easy to say, okay, for sample 104, 78% of people have said that it's a good pants, uh, leakage, good leakage protection. Um, so we can use that in our advertising and say 78% of people said this. Also, when we look at it, we can say, um, kind of from this point of view, well, sample four is definitely the best product because it's got a much higher percentage than the other ones. But as Thomas mentioned, we now need to look at the statistical difference, see if there's a significant difference because you can't use that data and say, yeah, sample four is the best product, it's got 78% more, because we don't know if there's a statistical significant difference between these products yet that we can say that. So this is what that breakdown looks like. So this is to do with the absorption the capacity of the pants. Um, so you can see we've got the different product codes at the top. Um, and then if we look down at the two key tests, which is the specific statistical, statistical analysis that we're doing here, um, you can see we've got the samples in order of what was rated highest and what was rated lowest. So we've gone by the mean average at this point. Now, mean average for sample four is 402 um, and so on and so forth. They need to differ by at least 0.5483%, uh, sorry, 
whatever the number is, <laughs> not of a cent. Um, for us to be able to say whether it's significantly different or not. Sorry, these are the hardest words to say all at once. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there is a significant difference. This is all built in. It's telling us by the statistics that are built in, by the number of people that are on the study, this is the amount that it needs to differ by for us to say it's significantly different. So when we look at that, it's only sample one to sample four that have a significant difference. The other samples aren't significantly different. So although we had a high percentage on sample four, um, the percentage uh, with the other um, kind of products doesn't actually show any difference um, at all significantly on the statistics. That was a lot to get out, but I hope that makes complete sense. <laughs> so we know that sample four basically is only better than sample one. And that's what we can take um, from that. If we had more respondents on this, we might find that actually we could get, um, we, could, we could find another more significant differences. This is because that number basically gets smaller. Um, as Thomas was saying with the confidence intervals, the more people we have on the study, um, the less they actually need to differ by to be able to say what that difference is. Um, so it's much, much easier for us to be able to say if there's a significant difference or not. It's also really important when you're saying a sample is as good as something, because even though there's no significant difference between two, three and four, we don't necessarily mean, mean to say that sample two is as good as sample four, because again, we, our brackets are too wide here for us to be able to say that, um, because again, if we have more people, it might find that there is a significant difference. So it, it really is down to how many people you've got on there. But uh, yeah, I hope that's kind of summarized there, how that's really broken down and how you can tell that significant difference. So now I kind of want to go on to the regulatory side of um, claims and comparison testing and everything like that. So you can kind of get an idea of once you've got that data, how can you actually use it legally? Um, so as I said, every country is slightly differing in um, comparison testing laws, but this is a really good outline of you know, what comparisons are um, and yeah, how you can start thinking about using them. So in the, if the ASA basically says the purpose is either to compare the quality, so this product's better than that product, that's what we usually see. We can also have things like cheaper, uh, the performance, you see that a lot in um, sort of car adverts and stuff like that, it goes faster. Uh, and then the market share, so it's the best selling product. Um, so that's simply to do with kind of financial review. They didn't always fall into that that, those categories, sorry. Um, and you don't always have to say what the comparison is. So I said best selling product, you're not necessarily saying that's against any other uh, sort of naming any other competitors, but you have got that data to say you're best selling. Same with comparisons, uh, you don't often see people actually go out against a named competitor, um, as I said, apart from in the States and places like that. Um, but they do make claims to say they're, um, they're a better product. So sometimes you also compare against your own product, as Thomas was talking about earlier. Um, this is what you'll usually see when people say a new and improved formula or something like that. Um, so it's a really effective way of uh, kind of marketing your product with a kind of new lease of life. Um, you need to be really careful about certain claims like best, leading and cheapest because you might have to substantiate against the entire market. So this is where things like best selling is, is quite a good thing to get because you can get that market data, you can look at financial reports. Um, but if you want to say it is the best hand cream, um, essentially you would have to turn this against every single hand cream that's on the market and this would be um, unfeasible. So always be really, really careful um, about yeah, what kind of claims you're making there because you might find yourself in a bit of hot water. Um, so identifiable competitors. So this is a really good example with the Pepsi Cola. This is an age old comparison claim. It's one of my favorites. We all know about it, the taste test and everything like that. Um, so they're literally exactly that, naming each other's brands and going against each other on the comparison. It's allowed as long as it's based on objective criteria. So it, it can't be unlikely to mislead in any way. So this is where we were saying about uh, Pepsi and Coda, the taste test, um, the blind taste test. It's blind, so it's subjective. There's no bias towards it. Uh, and people are saying, I like that one better than that one. It's a really nice direct comparison, as we mentioned earlier. Um, so you must have really good um, evidence behind any kind of uh, comparison claim against a competitor. As it says here, relevant, verifiable, and representative evidence. Um, so basically, the, the main thing to know is if you're going to get a competitor, get as much data as you can and make sure it's, um, 
as, as well conducted as it can possibly be with the, cor the correct methodology. You know, don't go for your uh, monadic test, as Thomas said, that might not be sensitive enough to really say it. Um, but you might find that, yeah, certain methodologies are more accepted than others. Um, and it's always really important to look at the regulations in that particular territory as well. Um, and even check with advertising standards. That's never a bad call, um, especially you know in, in the UK. I, I call up the ASA quite often about claims that we're making to make sure that people can say them. So you could say, I'm looking at doing this test uh, against this competitor. Would that be verifiable evidence to say that it's better um, in kind of theory before you go forward? So these things can always be done. Don't ever feel like you need to take the risk and just put your kind of claims out there. Um, so yes, basically, yeah, make sure that you're always checking uh, with uh, your advertising standards in that country. Unidentified competitors, obviously have fewer requirements um, because you're not kind of like the, <laughs> directly attacking someone, but you still need to have some kind of evidence to state it. Um, and you always need to make sure that they're not misled. So uh, this is a quite a good example. Does your skin deserve better? And you've got your Dove, um, Dove body wash and it's got an unbranded bottle that just says harsher. So it's obviously, there's gonna be some data behind this that's better than other brands. Um, they probably have that shaped bottle, so it's probably not that unidentifiable, um, but it's a really good example to say what's um, exactly that, just to have some evidence behind it, but you don't need to communicate uh, directly what that brand is. Um, and it's it's a really um, really common over the here in the EU, like I said, whereas, whereas in the states it might be much more identifiable. So I want to give some examples of advertising claims um, and how they've been used. Some comparison claims um, because again it always helps in context. So we've got some on social media. As you can see, um, advertising comparison claims tend to be much kind of harsher <laughs> than they are maybe for other kind of claims that you make. So the BMW one was, uh, was quite a good attack on Mercedes to say they were trying to dress up as their favorite superhero. Um, and Wendy's was an interesting one because uh, it was more to do with than saying they had fresher beef. So they're saying your beef's still frozen and attacking the Big Mac. Um, but obviously there had to be some kind of evidence behind that to say that Wendy's beef isn't frozen and that McDonald's was. Uh, so it's quite interesting, uh, direct one uh, to go for. Um, on TV as well, um, so we've got uh, the, um, the Pilsner, the light beer, and saying that it's got more taste than half the carbs. There would have to be some kind of taste test there to say it's better tasting. And obviously there's gonna be some data there to say about what the nutritional information is. Um, the internet cover um, wireless uh, coverage, again, you can tell which ones have come from the USA. They're much more direct saying this brand is better than this brand. Um, and that one obviously is just done by 3G coverage. So there'll be some data there that they've managed to gather. And it's one of my favorite ones that we've got here in the UK are the Aldi adverts. I'm sure if you're based in the UK, you've seen them. Um, so they're quite clever because they basically do taste tests um, to say, you know, which, which, which ones you like. Um, and then they're doing it as a comparison on price because obviously Aldi's knockoff version of <laughs> Jaffa Cakes is cheaper than the real thing. Um, but 96% of them also like Aldi. So again, they're not saying it's better um, than the Jaffa Cakes. They're just saying they also like it. Um, so it's really clever comparison advertising there. So Thomas, if you can summarize for us. Yeah, happy to. So um, what you've seen is there are many reasons why you want to compare products and might, you might want to run a test. And I'm sure you've encountered quite a few of these reasons. Um, not so sure if you've always thought about running a test, <laughs> but maybe you change your mind. And there are different test methods you can use depending on your objectives. Uh, and of course, your market research agency will be ha happy to advise you and help you which ones to choose. You don't need to make your choice yourself. We just wanted to flag the issue that there are different ones and, uh, <clears throat> and the different reasons why you want to go for one method versus the other. And the considerations are consumer reality, the length of the test and the cost, and of course, the test sensitive, sensitivity. And never forget about the sample size. Uh, reflected a few times. If you really want to have significant test differences, increase the sample size. Um, test results need to be significant if you want to use a respective claim, especially in communication. Um, and I think Carol's mails are very clear. You need to check the legislation, especially if you want to compare with your competition. 
Great, thanks, Thomas. So before we go to a QA, and a I just want to summarise, you know, you've heard a lot from us about what, how we do our statistics and how you can ask your testing house, but why should you choose us in particular? So we're an award-winning research agency. We've won awards for um, an international business, family business, things like that. We're fully compliant with the GDPR and we have an ISO 2701 to prove this. Um, it's really important, obviously, we're EU-based. We have to be GDPR compliant, um, but I think this was really helpful Thing globally to know that our data protection is at a very very high standard not just for our consumers for the people testing the products but also for your very sensitive data that you're giving us we have full undesirable event reporting which is made in, in accordance with the cosmetic vigilance act um, so again this is a really important thing no matter what test you're doing whether it's a comparison um, it's really important to have some kind of undesirable events reported and certainly through doing a consumer research study, which is what we do, um, you get to have that uh, uh, event, undesirable event data in real conditions, so not in a kind of laboratory controlled condition. We've got full product liability insurance, um, and that's in every country that we operate. Um, so obviously important to protect our uh, participants, but also to protect you as well. We've got an ISO 9001, which is our um, quality assurance uh, audit as well. We're a, a partner to the Market Research Society, um, so you know that our, um, our research is done in accordance with their code of conduct and that it's also ethical. You get uh, bespoke regulatory advice, uh, so you can always come to me if you want any further information. And you get your own designated study manager as well, should you choose us. So you only have one point of contact who will manage all of your research objectives and things like that and make sure that we get the best data for you possible. So let's go to a QA. and a um, So feel free to put any questions you have in the little Q&A box, um, which is towards the bottom of the screen. As Thomas always says, please challenge us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, come, on. come on, challenge us. <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> As always, people are, people are so shy these days. <laughs> I can't believe we've answered all questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, as, as always, if you can't think of any questions on the spot, please, I will um, follow this up with the recording. So please feel free to email them over. But let's get a bit of a discussion going if you can. I'll leave it open for a couple of minutes more. Okay, I won't put any fish brush on you. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to put over any questions if you do need anything further at all. But we'll just finish up for today. Um, so just to finish off, uh, I just want to flag up some of the SCS events and courses. So we've got the distance uh, learning course in the essentials of cosmetic science. Um, that can be done anywhere in the world and at any time. It's all based online. So if you're interested in learning some more about, uh, learning some more about cosmetic science, I would highly recommend to have a look at that. Um, there is the IFSCC Congress that will be in London on the 19th to the 22nd of September 2022. So please also feel free to register your interest for that one as well. Uh, we have a couple more webinars coming up in the schedule, um, sort of rounding off towards the end of the year. So our next one is on the 13th of November and it's claims for food and drink in particular. We've done a lot of cosmetic ones, um, so we thought we'd give the food and drink people a chance as well to learn a bit more. Um, we've also got one on the 11th of December, which is going to be test timing throughout the year. So this is preparing you essentially for the next year coming up. Um, and because as you'll learn from us, it's really, really important to start thinking about how you need to schedule and plan uh, testing around your new product development for certain claims. So there is our contact information there. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for all your input, Thomas. That's been really amazing. Thank you, Karis. It was a pleasure as always. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and I will be following up on email shortly.